service. Um, apparently, apparently there's another gig going on up the road, so let's make sure that we sing louder than them. Um, <laughs> I was hoping maybe Lewis Capaldi would be walking in the scheme and would come into church, but... <laughs> um, okay, right. Um, uh, just one big announcement to say, and that is that this Wednesday, uh, the prayer meeting's at 6 p.m. It's a food prayer meeting. Um, so if you want to cook something for that, speak to Rachel. Um, it's, not, it's not a themed night. Like, it's, the, theme is, uh, the theme is Dundee food. The theme is what, sorry? The theme is food. So whatever kind of food uh, you feel comfortable making. Uh, if you'd like to make something for that or even just bring something to that, speak to Rachel, that would be really helpful. Um, and if not, Rachel just chases up. But that's this Wednesday, 6 p.m. We're going to eat together and we're going to um, pray together. Just another announcement to say as well, uh, the Seniors Lunch Club is not this Wednesday, oh. it's next Wednesday. So, the 7th, yeah. So, on the 7th, um, Seniors Lunch Club will be on uh, and again a chance to eat some food and that'd be great thank you very much um, excellent there we go we're sorted already yeah we know that uh, okay yeah that yeah that sounds lovely, Maisie. Thank you very much. So that'll be on the 7th. Um, yeah, that's right. So this Wednesday, prayer meeting, 6 p.m. Uh, it'd be great if you could come along uh, to that, to eat together, pray together. I'm going to um, read some words as we begin our service today from Psalm 95. The Psalms are songs in the Bible written thousands of years ago, songs that God's people Israel would have sung together, songs that the Church of Jesus has sung for hundreds of years. Uh, and Psalm 95 is an invitation to worship and praise God. This is what the psalmist says. Come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before him with thanksgiving and extol him with music and song. For the Lord is the great God, the great King above all gods. In his hand are the depths of the earth and the mountain peaks belong to him. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands formed the dry land. Come, let us bow down and worship. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker, for he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture, the flock under his care. Today, if only you would hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as you did at Meribah, as you did that day at Massa in the wilderness. The psalmist invites us to come and worship God. But right near the end of the psalm, he, he gives a warning. He says, today if you hear God's voice, make sure you do not harden your heart. As the Israel of the past did in a place called Massa and Meribah, don't do it. It's a call to worship, but it's a call to listen to what God is going to say. And as we open the Bible, God will be speaking to us from his word. Let's not harden our hearts. Let's listen and let's worship. Let's begin by singing. We're actually going to sing that psalm together. So let's stand together and we'll sing Psalm 95.
to uh, have a seat. We're going to pray now as we come to worship God. Uh, every week we like to pray for a different nation and uh, a different church that we are partnered with uh, as a reminder that the good news of Jesus that we want to see spread throughout this scheme here, we want to see spread across the nations of the world as well. Uh, today we're going to pray for the nation of Gambia. Anyone know where that is? Africa. Whereabouts in Africa? West. West. Yeah, well done. West is best. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, baby. Uh, um, Gambia has 2.7 million people, predominantly uh, Muslim as a country, but we thank God for the mostly friendly relationships between Muslims and Christians in Gambia. Christians have a lot more freedom in that country than they do in many other countries in Africa. We want to pray that the gospel would reach the people there, especially the many unreached people groups, and particularly we want to pray for a movement of the gospel amidst the young people and many ministries that are done to reach uh, teenagers and students in Gambia. We are going to pray for that. And we're also going to pray for a church that we are connected with through 20 Schemes. Uh, for those of you who don't know, 20 Schemes is uh, a network of churches that wants to plant churches and housing schemes across Scotland. And this morning we are going to pray for Gracemount Community Church. It's a housing scheme in Edinburgh. We're going to pray for them. They've got a couple of baptisms coming up in two weeks. So we rejoice with that. Kip and Joy, that's the two names. Um, and uh, Andy was saying that this lady, Joy, who has come to know Jesus, local uh, woman in the scheme, she very much now epitomizes her name. And she just enjoys Jesus. And so we celebrate the gospel and what it's done in their lives. Um, we're going to pray that they will get a new building. They've been looking for a new building for a long time now. They're desperate to have a building in the scheme. And so we'll pray for them as they try and move forward with that. And uh, like us here, they are in need of an assistant. And so we're going to pray that they will find someone that will be able to come and help with the work. Amazing things that have really happened in uh, Grace Mount Community Church. And we praise God for that. Um, so let's pray for both those things and let's pray confessing our sin as we come and worship God. Let's pray together. Father, we want to sing for joy to the Lord. We want to shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Father, as we step outside this building, we can hear the cheers and the singing coming from Camperdown Park. But Father, we can do that every day because of what Jesus has done for us. Father, as we come to worship you, we acknowledge as your church that we are sinners. We acknowledge that we are rebels, that we have failed you, that we have let you down. Father, you tell us to love you with our whole heart, soul, mind, and strength. We haven't done that. You tell us, love your neighbor as yourself. Father, there are times this week we haven't done that. We admit that we are not sorted. We admit that we are not healthy. We admit that we're sinners. But we praise you, Jesus, that you have not come to call the healthy, but the sick that you have come to call sinners to repentance. And so, Father, as we confess to you now as your church that we have messed up and many of us will have particular things in our minds, we, we also want to acknowledge that you are the God of grace and that our salvation is not dependent upon how well we've done, but on what Jesus Christ has done for us. We thank you that it's a gift salvation. It's not something that we earn. We thank you that Jesus has paid the punishment for the sins of this past week, that it's gone on him and he has suffered the wrath of God for all our failures and we are justified. We are righteous. We are your children, not because we deserve it, but because you are good and gracious and kind. It's because of your love that we are safe. And so we worship you, great God of grace. And we pray and we ask that as we come to hear from your word, would our hearts not be hardened? 
Would you pierce through them? Would you comfort us? Would you challenge us? Father, we want to see Jesus. We want to understand the gospel afresh this morning as we gather as your church. And we want that gospel truth not just to be embedded in our hearts, but in people all across the world. And so this morning, we want to pray specifically for the nation of Gambia. We thank you, Lord, for the church growth that has happened there. We thank you for the religious freedom that the Christians have. And we pray for Gambians to have a vision to reach their nation. We pray for creative ways to support those who are in more isolated areas. We pray particularly, Lord, would the gospel move from the, the west coast of Gambia further inland to the many unreached people groups there that don't know Jesus and don't have the hope of Jesus. We pray, Lord, would the church thrive? Father, we want to pray especially for the young people in the capital of Banjul. We thank you for the ministries to them, including the ministry of IFES and SU and Youth for Christ. Father, we pray that these ministries would raise up a new generation of Christian young people who will lead their peers into a lifestyle of godliness and a desire to reach the lost with the gospel. Please grow your church in that nation, we pray. Father, closer to home, we want to thank you for what you have done in Grace Mount Community Church. Father, we thank you for the lives that have been transformed by the gospel. Father, we want to thank you, especially this morning, for many young men who have come to know Jesus through the ministry of that church. Father, would you grow them into good, godly, mature men who will equip your church and serve it. Father, we want to praise you for the baptisms of Kip and Joy coming up, and we thank you that the gospel does indeed bring joy like nothing else. Father, would they be encouraged as these two are baptized, the great gospel going out. Father, we want to pray and ask, please, would you provide a, a building for them as they set up this new subcommittee, as they try their best to find somewhere, even just a piece of land in Gracemount, where they can meet. We ask, great God of heaven and earth, would you provide it for them? In your timing, would they ever be trusting you? And Father, please, would you provide an assistant for the ministry that is done there? Father, thank you for Andy and Sarah. Thank you for the elders. Thank you for the many people that serve that church and for the gospel that is proclaimed from it. Father, help us now as we come to the book of Proverbs. Would we not harden our hearts as Israel of the past did, but would we listen? Would this not just be going through the ritual, but would we hear what your Spirit is saying to us today? In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Okay, folks, if you have a Bible, open it up to Proverbs chapter 4, please. Proverbs chapter 4. Why? 638. If, um, if you've got yeah, one of these ones, it's 638. 474. There we go. I didn't even need to read it out. Oh, that's good. That's good. I love that. Um, 638, if you've got a Pebble Beach Bible, 474. If you've got the, the Mountain Bible, and if you've got the wee tiny ones, you're on your own. Oh, is it? Oh, the wee tiny ones are this. So the wee tiny ones, it's uh, six three eight. Craig did well, yes. Proverbs chapter four. We're going to read um, chapter four and five today. Um, for those of you that haven't been here, or those of you who might not know, or uh, just need a reminder. Uh, Proverbs is a book in the Bible. It's not a story. It's not um, a letter, but it's a book written by King Solomon to teach us how to be wise. And the first nine chapters of this book are these extended speeches that a father is giving to his teenage boy in which he's really just trying to motivate him to make the most of the life that is set before him by encouraging him to pursue wisdom. And it speaks to all of us today because, as I said, this father is not just any old dad. This is God's king, King Solomon. And his words are words for all of us today. If we are to make the most of life, 
what we need more than anything else, more than money, more than relationships, uh, more than anything is wisdom. We've said that wisdom is the skill to navigate life well. Wisdom stops you making a mess of your life. Wisdom will guide you, protect you, help you. It is what you need. If you're a follower of Jesus, it's what you need more than anything else. Now, <coughs> here's what we've learned so far from this father. I, I'm, I'm doing Proverbs with some teenagers in the summer. I'm going away for a week. I'm going to look at Proverbs, go out in towers. It's going to be great. And I was thinking, you know, it's like if you're, if you're climbing a mountain, you would have a checklist of everything you would need in place before you climb. Well, Proverbs chapter 1 to 9 is like a checklist of stuff that you must have in place before you journey on this journey that we call life. Now, here's what we've seen so far. How does that begin? Firstly, it begins with fearing God. That means not being afraid that God will hurt you. Rather, it means stepping back and seeing God as big and yourself as small. When you see the greatness of God, that's when you start to be wise and make good choices. Secondly, it means being careful with the company you keep. We saw that when we looked at chapter 1. There's many voices out there, and we need to be careful who it is that we're listening to. Thirdly, it means earnestly asking God to give you wisdom. Father says to his son, if you do that, it will protect you in life. And finally, last week we saw it means trusting God with all your heart getting ready for wisdom, embracing wisdom is about trusting God, not yourself. Now, in chapter 4, the father wants to encourage his son not only to pursue wisdom, but to make sure he stays on wisdom's path. How do we do that? That's the question we're going to think about. Again, there's lots of stuff in here. This is like a, it's like a machine gun of Proverbs and wisdom just being fired at us, but hopefully it'll make sense uh, as we look at it together. So let me read it. Proverbs chapter 4 and chapter 5. It's a big reading today. Father says, Listen, my sons, to a father's instruction. Pay attention and gain understanding. I give you sound learning, so do not forsake my teaching. For I too was a son to my father, still tender and cherished by my mother. Then he taught me, and he said to me, Take hold of my words with all of your heart. Keep my commands, and you will live. Get wisdom. Get understanding. Do not forget my words or turn away from them. Do not forsake wisdom, and she will protect you. Love her, and she will watch over you. The beginning of wisdom is this. Get wisdom. Though it cost all you have, get understanding. Cherish her, and she will exalt you. Embrace her and she will honor you. She will give you a garland to grace your head and present you with a glorious crown. Listen, my son, accept what I say and the years of your life will be many. I instruct you in the way of wisdom and lead you along straight paths. When you walk, your steps will not be hampered. When you run, you will not stumble. Hold on to instruction. Do not let it go. Guard it well, for it is your life. Do not set foot on the path of the wicked or walk in the way of evildoers. Avoid it. Do not travel on it. Turn from it and go on your way, for they cannot rest until they do evil. They are robbed of sleep till they make someone stumble. They eat the bread of wickedness and drink the wine of violence. The path of the righteous is like the morning sun shining ever brighter till the full light of day. But the way of the wicked is like deep darkness. They do not know what makes them stumble. My son, pay attention to what I say. Turn your ear to my words. Do not let them out of your sight. Keep them within your heart. For they are life to those who find them and health to one's body. Above all else, Guard your heart, for everything you do flows from it. Keep your mouth free of perversity. Keep corrupt talk far from your lips. Let your eyes look straight ahead. Fix your gaze directly before you. Give careful thought to the paths for your feet and be steadfast in all your ways. 
Do not turn to the right or the left. Keep your foot from evil. My son, pay attention to my wisdom. Turn your ear to my words of insight, that you may maintain discretion and your lips may preserve knowledge. For the lips of the adulterous woman drip honey, and her speech is smoother than oil. But in the end, she is as bitter as gall, sharp as a double-edged sword. Her feet go down to death. Her steps lead straight to the grave. She gives no thought to the way of life. Her paths wander aimlessly, but she does not know it. Now then, my sons, listen to me. Do not turn aside from what I say. Keep to a path far from her. Do not go near the door of her house, lest you lose your honor to others and your dignity to one who is cruel. Lest strangers feast on your wealth and your toil enrich the house of another. At the end of your life, you will groan when your flesh and body are spent. You will say how I hated discipline, how my heart spurned correction. I would not obey my teachers or turn my ear to my instructors, and I was soon in serious trouble in the assembly of God's people. Drink water from your own cistern. Run in water from your own well. Should your springs overflow in the streets, your streams of water in the public squares, let them be yours alone, never to be shared with strangers. May your fountain be blessed. May you rejoice in the wife of your youth, a loving doe, a graceful deer. May her breast satisfy you always. May you ever be intoxicated with her love. Why, my son, be intoxicated with another man's wife? Why embrace the bosom of a wayward woman? For your ways are in full view of the Lord, and he examines all your paths. The evil deeds of the wicked ensnare them. The cords of their sins hold them fast. For lack of discipline, they will die, led astray by their own great folly. Amen. This is God's word. Um, Before we look at this passage together, we're going to sing a song that reminds us uh, that our salvation is by grace alone, and it comes through Christ alone. So let's stand together, and we will sing, The Lord is my salvation. The grace of God has reached for me and pulled me from the raging sea, and I am safe on the solid ground. The Lord is my salvation.
message promise of his word when winter Radio 1, I've got uh, as good roadies as I've got. <laughs> Proverbs chapter 4. Proverbs chapter 4. Uh, get your Bibles open on that. Uh, those two chapters of Proverbs. I don't know, um, there's a lot going on here, but I don't know if you notice that the one thing that seems to be, two things that are repeated in these chapters. One is this idea of the heart. We're going to talk about that. And the other is this idea of a path. And so it's actually a common uh, theme in the book of Proverbs. When the father is speaking to his son, he wants his son to picture life as a journey. A journey with two paths that you can walk on. One path leads to freedom, it leads to good choices, and it leads to an eternity with God. The other path leads to despair. It leads to bad choices, and it leads to an eternity without God. This is the path of wisdom, and this other path is the path of folly. And the author of Proverbs, uh, Solomon, and indeed the whole Bible would say that all of us will be on one of these two paths in our life. Uh, Jesus uses a similar illustration, but he goes on to say something quite shocking about these two paths. He says that the path that leads to destruction is broad, and many people are on it. But the path that leads to life 
is narrow and not many people find it. This is not just good advice, folks, that we are looking at. This is about our life, where it's going and where we'll spend eternity. Serious stuff. Let me say this, if you want to be on that path of wisdom that leads to life, that leads to forgiveness, that leads to God, here's what the Bible says you have to do. Do not try and be a good person and think that will get you on that path. Don't try and sort yourself out. The only way you can get on this path is to trust in Jesus. Repent of your sin, trust in Jesus, trust that he will take the punishment for your sin upon himself as he died on that cross. You do that and you are on the path that leads to life. And look, when Jesus saves you, he doesn't lose you. But the way that he keeps us and the way that we stay on this path is through persevering with him in wisdom. I really want us to be clear before we come to Proverbs 4 that you being saved for all eternity, we've got to get this because we we default into thinking the opposite, but you being saved for all eternity is nothing to do with you. It's everything to do with Jesus. It's his grace, it's his love, it's his mercy that saves us. We bring nothing to the table. That's why we just sung that song. The Lord is my salvation. Not me, not my goodness, not my devotion. God saves me. I don't save myself. But we show that we are those who, are, who have genuinely been saved by grace by how we live. And that is seen by walking this path of wisdom. Now, I love the fact that wisdom is called a path here not a door. So it's not something, it's not like you pass through it and then, hey, I'm wise. It's not like I've become a Christian, therefore I'm wise. Wisdom's not a door. It's a path. It's a journey that you go on. And it's something we should be increasing in the more we go with Jesus. Let me say, it's not an easy path. It's a hard path many times. But we must remember that we don't walk this path to be saved, we walk this path because we are saved. So the question we're going to think about today is, how do I keep going faithfully in wisdom with Jesus and not drift away from him? Our focus is going to be chapter 4, and we're going to look at verse 20 to 27. That's where we're going to spend most of our time. But I just want to mention two points the father says to his son that surround these Uh, wonderful verses. The very simple points. You may have heard them before. There's two paths. Here's the first point. Keep on wisdom's path at all costs, right? What does the father want his son to have? I mean, from that reading, what does he want his son to have? Yeah. He really wants him to have wisdom, doesn't he? You hear the passion in him? He's sitting down with his lad and he's saying, Mate, you've got to listen to me. If I want to give you one piece of advice, if, you, if you're going to take one thing from me, let it be this. Make sure that you get wisdom. Look at verse 1. Listen, my son, to a father's instruction. Pay attention and gain understanding. I give you sound, lear- sound learning, so do not forsake my teaching. For I too was a son to my father, still tender and cherished by my mother. Then he taught me, he said to me, Take hold of my words with all your heart. Keep my commands and you will live. Get wisdom. Get understanding. Do not forget my words or turn away from them. Do not forsake wisdom and she will protect you. Love her and she will watch over you. I love this verse. The beginning of wisdom is this. Get wisdom. You want to be wise? Get wisdom. Though it cost all you have, Get understanding. Cherish her and she will exalt you. Embrace her and she will honor you. She will give you a garland to grace your head and present you with a glorious crown. Now, if you've been with us as we've looked through Proverbs, there's a bit of deja vu here. This is what he's been saying every chapter for the past three weeks. You must get wisdom. Why is he telling us again and why is he going to keep on saying this in the chapters that follow. He's saying it 
Exactly. Is it sinking in? You don't need to shout out an answer to this, but just think about this. How many of us have passionately pursued wisdom this past week? Let me ask another question to think about. How many of us have done something foolish this past week? Yeah, I could put my hand up to that too. Are we, are we actually listening to what we've just been told? Right, all of us were once teenagers. Some of us are about to be teenagers. How many times did mom or dad or whoever it was looking after you have to tell you not to do something daft? Right, I guarantee they never just told you once and that was you sorted. How many times did you have to be told time and time and time again, don't do that, don't hang out with them, don't go there. And how many times did we not listen to what they said? It needs to be repeated till it sinks in, as Tammy said. It's like that film, um, I don't know if you've ever seen the film Goodwill Hunting. Seen that, Tam? No, no. Oh. That's right. But I've never seen it. No, yeah. Well, in, in the film, Matt Damon plays this, you know, working class genius from Boston, but he's had a really abusive childhood. And he's speaking to his therapist, who's played by Robin Williams. And at one point, they're having this argument, and Robin Williams just says to him, famous scene, he goes, it's not your fault. And he says, yeah, yeah, I know. He goes, no, no, it's, it, it's not your fault. He says, yeah, I know it's not my fault. And he says, no, it's not your fault. And he keeps saying it, it's not your fault, it's not your fault. And eventually, it produces a reaction in which Matt Damon's character just breaks down in tears because the words finally hit home. He repeats it so that it will take root. Are we really pursuing wisdom? Are we wait or, or are we just waiting for wisdom to come to us? Have you grown stale and cold to the greatness of the gospel of Jesus? If so, stand in, do not stand still and think that wisdom will just come to you, that the fire will come back if you just do nothing. Though it cost all you have, get understanding. Seek Jesus. Meditate on his word. Draw close to him in prayer. Read your Bible. Yeah, we muck up. Yeah, we do foolish things. But press on, seeking his forgiveness, knowing that he always gives it to you, that his love is always there for you, and that he will never leave you, even if you wander from him. Stay. Keep on wisdom's path at all costs. And here's the other side of what he says. It's basically the same argument. Avoid the path of folly at all costs. Look at verse 14. Do not set foot on the path of the wicked or walk in the way of evildoers. Avoid it. Do not travel on it. Turn from it and go on your way for they cannot rest until they do evil. They are robbed of sleep till they make someone stumble. They eat the bread of wickedness and drink the wine of violence. There is a path that leads away from God, and there are people on that path, and they want you to be on it with them. It's the kind of people that verse 16 says are robbed of sleep till they make someone stumble. People who need to see others fall, who hate when others succeed, who hate that you've left that old lifestyle and now you're walking with Jesus. Don't be lured back, the father says to his son. It's so easy. And it often begins with indulging what we would call small sins, which then grow and spread and lead astray. I wonder, do we realize how easily swayed our hearts can be. That's exactly what he says, isn't it? I, I know many people who I was at university with, right? And at the time, you would have said, they're on fire for Jesus, and now they want nothing to do with him. How'd that happen? They gradually walked onto that path of folly. Now, let me be clear about something. I said at the start, I'll say it again, the Bible is clear. Those who are genuinely saved cannot lose their salvation. Can't lose something you didn't deserve in the first place. But you know that you're genuinely saved by the fact you persevere. Not by being perfect, but by fighting on through the difficulties and temptation. 
And that picture of temptation uh, given in chapter 5 is one of like a, a seductive woman. Could easily be a man, but he's speaking to his son. That's why he mentions this woman. Look at uh, this description of temptation. Look at chapter 5, verse 1. My son, pay attention to my wisdom. Turn your ear to my words of insight, that you may maintain discretion and your lips may preserve knowledge. For the lips of the adulterous woman drip honey, and her speech is smoother than oil. But in the end, she is bitter as gall, sharp as a double-edged sword. Her feet go down to death. Her steps lead straight to the grave. She gives no thought to the way of life. Her paths wander aimlessly, but she does not know it. It's a great picture of temptation, of the emptiness that it offers. He's saying to son, be careful. You are not seduced by folly. Now look, there are many things that can tempt us on a path away from God. The love of money could be the drink, the drugs, the bad company, a, a desire to be well-liked. It could be the pursuit of a, of a relationship. But look, one of the big things mentioned throughout Proverbs, and we're really going to focus on it when we get to chapter 7, is sex. So friends, I know who have walked away from God. I'll be honest, it's often because of someone they've wanted to sleep with. It's really easy for us to be seduced by that because it feels good and, you know, it feels good to be wanted. But don't lose sight of the God who saved you. Remember, He wants you. He cares about you. And that path away from Him will not bring joy. Ultimately, as verse 6 says, it's an aimless path. There's no, there's no end in sight. It's no direction beyond the immediate temporal pleasure, and it doesn't last or go anywhere. Bible is really not anti-sex. Um, so just look at verse 18 to 20 of chapter 5. You could just read that yourself. I was so tempted to spend time in those verses, but it would give even the folks of Charleston a mentor. <laughs> it's good, clearly, isn't it? He's celebrating it there but it's to be enjoyed God's way. It's not just an appetite. It's a beautiful covenant union between one man and one woman in the context of a loving marriage. You see, one of the ways we get seduced onto folly's path is that we believe the lie that the devil told Eve right at the beginning. God's a killjoy. It's not fun. Everything God does is for our joy, even though we don't deserve it. Our problem is that we misplace where we look for joy. We look for it in small things rather than the infinite wellspring of joy and love, which is namely God himself. And so the father warns his son, avoid temptation's path. Whatever temptation it is for you, I, I don't know, you know. You know where your weaknesses are. Avoid that path. So here's the question we've got there. Here's the big question that I want us to focus on. How, how do we do that? How do we make sure we stay on wisdom's path? How do we keep fighting temptation? Because we won't conquer it. We all fail. All of us here have given in to temptation. Even this past week, I'm sure many of us have done that. If that's you, and you're hearing this, and you're just despairing, and there was a moment that you let your guard down, listen, don't despair. For our Savior has died for our failures. He loves you and he's paid the price for that wrong. Salvation is his gift that he gives to you, not something that you earn. And let that truth pick you up and encourage you to keep fighting and to honor him in your life. So how do we keep going in this path with Jesus and fight against temptation? Well, it's not about going on the offensive but it's about what we do on the defensive. Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23. Here's our anchor verse today. This is the key verse. Above all else, guard your heart, for everything you do flows from it. This is how you keep going as a Christian. Guard your heart above everything else. This is what we must protect. Now, we have to understand what Solomon means when he talks about the heart here. Uh, we tend to think of it 
I mean, we know it's not just the organ that pumps blood. We, when we use that word heart, we tend to think about our emotions. So we might say something like, if we've got a choice, well, my head says this, but my heart says this. In other words, my, my intellect, my reason are saying one thing, but my emotions are saying something else. That's not what it means in the Bible. In the Bible, your heart is your entire inner being. It's your thought, it's your will, it's your reason, it's your emotions. It's what's on the inside of you. And when Jesus saves you from sin, what he wants to do is transform your heart. He transforms you from the inside out. This was the problem with the religious guys at Jesus' time. Outside, they looked very religious and pious, and they prayed, and they read their Bible. But Jesus says inside they were dead, like a whitewashed tomb. Their hearts weren't changed. They weren't doing it for the right reason. Jesus is about an inside out transformation, changing your heart. And when he changes your heart, then deeds will flow from that. Like it says here, everything you do flows from the heart. So think of it like a plant. You've got the leaves on the outside, but it's the roots that make it live, that give it the stability. Kill the roots, you kill the plant. That's the source of it. For us, the source of everything we do flows out of our hearts, our inner being. And so if we are to walk faithfully with God in life and pursue wisdom, we must protect our hearts. Now, we don't do that alone. We have God's spirit at work within us, but we must guard it from tempting lies. Okay, that sounds, that sounds great. How do I do that? Well, this is where the rest of these verses help us. We guard our hearts by being careful about how we use the other parts of our body. So let's see, see four ways we can guard our hearts, and this that will help us keep going on this path of wisdom. So he, here's the image, right? Have, have this image in your mind. Think of your heart, your inner being, being the center of this fortress. It's the most important thing. So you want to protect it, surrounded by these walls. But there's four potential weak points in the walls of these fortress that we need to be aware of so that our hearts will be protected. What are they? Well, like I said, it's all to do with your body. Guard your heart, first of all, by being careful with what your ears hear. It's the first thing he says. So look at verse 20. How many times has this father said, listen, my son, pay attention to what I say. Turn your ear to my words. Do not let them out of your sight. Keep them within your heart, for they are life to those who find them and health to one's whole body. It's the key question. Are we listening to God? like really listening? Or do we find that our choices and even the way that we view life is actually being shaped by other people? It doesn't have to be bad people. It's shaped by my friends, family, but they don't know Jesus. So am I spending more time listening to them than I actually am listening to God? Is it shaped by what I watch, by what I see on my phone? I heard some good advice. Um, and I think it's, it's really helpful to, to make sure that when we get up in the morning, the first thing we listen to is God's word. Here's what I do when I get up in the morning. My phone's there. Bed's there. I wake up, grab the phone, and I'm like that. Put a Bible there instead of your phone. See if that makes a difference to your day. Are we listening? Do you know when Jesus... When he taught people, he said, he always said this weird phrase kind of near the end of his teaching. He said, if you've got ears to hear, listen. Now, we've all got ears to hear. Why did he say that? Because he knows that we hear the words, but they go and out there. Are we hearing, actually hearing what God's been saying? Have the words gone in? We're in danger, all of us, of doing what verse 20 says, of letting God's word go out of our sight. Don't let his word disappear like the steam coming off your cup of tea. Rather, keep it in your heart. That means meditate on his word every day. Seek to live by it. Pray through it. Treasure it. Read it. That is what will help us in the battle against temptation. It's what will challenge us. 
Remember what we sang in Psalm 95? Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart. Let the word of God melt hearts that are being hardened by sin's deceitfulness. And sometimes that hurts. But the word of God cuts you not to harm you, but to heal you. It cuts you not like a killer's sword, but a surgeon's scalpel. Solomon says in verse 22, these words are life and health to one's body. The Bible is like good food to weary souls. And so if you're feeling flat and you're losing sight of God, pray and listen to him. And yes, even though it challenges, it also comforts. It comforts us by showing us the God who forgives us every day, who picks us up, who loves us, and tells us to keep going. If you want the fire in your heart, you've got to read the Bible and see Jesus. You know, that's what happened. After Jesus' resurrection on the road to Emmaus, he was walking with two of his disciples. They didn't recognize him. He was walking with them, and what he did with them is he opened up the Bible and showed them how everything in the Old Testament was all about him. Then he disappeared. And when the two of them talked about that Bible study, this is what they said, did not our hearts burn within us as he opened the scripture? Protect your heart. Build a fortress around it. And do it by listening to God's word. Be careful with what you're listening to. Secondly, careful with what your mouth says. Look at verse 24. Keep your mouth free of perversity. Keep corrupt talk from your lips. Um, By the way, just think about this for me personally. This is one of those verses that I could be in danger of reading in the Bible but not actually doing anything about. The book of Proverbs has a lot to say about speech. Loads. It's probably the main topic. There is nothing more dangerous and deadly than our words. What was it they said in in World War II? Loose lips sink ships. Trying to encourage people, be careful with your speech. It's dangerous. Here's one I've made up. Speech that's smart will guard your heart. Not bad, eh? (laughs) Often if our hearts are far from God, and if they are starting to become hardened, here's, here's a good litmus test. How are you speaking about other people? Keep your mouth free from perversity, the Father says. That, doesn't, that means not joining in the dirty jokes, but it's more than that. It means don't get involved in the gossip. Lots of that in the scheme. Lots of that in Charleston. Lots of that in the workplace. Don't make fun of or mock other people. Don't bring them down with your words and dehumanize them. That's perverse. It means, and this is a big one we'll focus on next week, don't lie. Avoid corrupting talk. It's interesting, in the book of Proverbs, I think the only time it talks about God hating something is when it talks about lies. Lying lips are an abomination to the Lord, it will say. Why? Because that's the devil's territory. That's not God's territory. Speak the truth. In our struggles, truth about our victories, speak in love. Doing that protects the heart from hard-heartedness. The Apostle Paul says in Colossians 3 that because Jesus has saved us and changed our hearts, we show that by speaking differently. He says, you must rid yourselves of all such things as anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other since you have taken off your old self with its practices and have put on the new self which has been renewed in the knowledge and the image of its creator. Watch what your mouth says. Thirdly, watch what your eyes see. Verse 25, let your eyes look straight ahead. Fix your gaze directly before you. Often temptation comes through what we are watching. We look at others with envy at what they've got. We read magazine articles or books that feed unhelpful thoughts into our minds. Don't watch stuff that will lead you into temptation. If it's late night TV, if it's going to the beach, if it's Instagram or TikTok, could be anything. I mean, you know, you know what it is. It lowers the guard on your heart. 
Like I said, this is probably one of the most dangerous tools we have for guarding our hearts. I'm not anti-phone, I like it. But we need to be really careful how we use this. Proverbs 27, the father says that the eyes are never satisfied. They're always looking for more. Sometimes we can't help what we see, but we can choose whether or not we keep looking, whether we dwell on it. Martin Luther once said this, it's impossible to keep the devil from shooting evil thoughts and lusts into your heart. It's impossible. It's going to happen. Yeah, yeah. So it's impossible for the devil to keep shooting evil, th- to keep the devil from shooting evil thoughts and lusts into your mind. But see to it that you do not let such arrows stick and take root. Tear them out and throw them away. Solomon says you can tear those arrows out by directing your gaze on the path that is in front of you. Keep your eyes fixed on Jesus. Look ahead to where you're going, to eternity with him. That's what the the author of Hebrews also says that. He says, look, the Christian life's like a race. And anyone who runs a race, what do they do to motivate themselves to keep going? They keep their eyes fixed on the prize. Hebrews 12, verse 2, let us run with perseverance, the race that is marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus. And listen to how he describes Jesus. He is the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. That's wonderful. He's the beginning of our faith, and he's the one who perfects our faith. We don't do that. And so if we have lost sight, and if we have veered off the path, Do not despair at yourself, but instead look to Jesus and how he has dealt with that sin and achieved the victory and let that motivate you to keep on running. Finally, you need to be careful where your feet walk. Look at how he goes on. Verse 26, give careful thought to the paths for your feet and be steadfast in all your ways. Do not turn to the right or the left. Keep your foot from evil. Um, This is kind of metaphorically, but I think we could apply this literally as well. You want to avoid temptation and guard your heart, watch where you're walking. Like if I'm struggling with the drink, it's maybe not a good idea for me to be walking past the gate every day. (laughs) Is there another route that's longer? But it helps, it's more helpful for my heart if I take that longer route. If I know that certain people are going to tempt me, Maybe it's not a good idea for me to walk past their house every day, looking. Actually, look at what the father says to the the young man being seduced by another woman in chapter 5, verse 8. He says, keep to a path far from her. Do not go near the door of her house. That's good advice for those of us struggling with addiction, isn't it? Let's not go near the door of temptation. Let's not even give temptation a chance to have a go. Let's stay away. apply it literally. I think we can apply it metaphorically too. What direction do we want to take our life? Yeah. Do we want our life to be geared towards Jesus and working for his kingdom? Or are there other paths that we are in danger of walking on? The path of comfort, the path of uh, just a nice life? Are we watching where we're taking our lives? Keep on the straight path. Walk faithfully. And guard your heart. Folks, I don't know what's threatening us at the moment um, in terms of temptation. We, I guess we know what weaknesses there are in the fortress that surrounds our hearts. But let's make sure that we have what uh, one commentator calls the anatomy of a disciple, which is a good description of these verses. Ears that listen to God, mouths that speak carefully to others, eyes that fix on Jesus, and feet that walk faithfully. That is how to guard your heart and keep on that path of wisdom. Like I said, every Christian has given in to temptation. Everyone here has given in to lust, to greed, to careless speech, to relapses, to cold-heartedness. But we mustn't indulge those failures. Take them to Jesus. Know that Jesus has paid the price for those sins and let his grace motivate you to keep walking on that path of wisdom. That's a good life. That's a life that has direction and purpose and joy. That's a life in which one day you will get to the end of that path 
and hear the voice of the King of Wisdom who will say to you, well done, my good and faithful servant. Let me pray. Father, help us to walk faithfully on the path of wisdom. Father, we want to just praise you that us being saved is not down to how faithful we are, but how faithful Jesus was. That it's your love and grace that saves us. And yet because that's true, we want to be faithful to you. We want to honor you with our lives, to stay on that path, to persevere in obedience and wisdom. And so, Father, would you help us do that by guarding our heart. Help us not willingly put ourselves in situations where the walls of our heart are brought down. Help us look at what our eyes see, what our ears hear, what our mouth says, where our feet go. Help us be careful knowing that, that the way you direct us is not to stifle our joy, but to give us joy. Knowing that this is a good life. Knowing that having that wisdom is to know your love and your joy and to know that path that gets better and better and increases all the more. Father, the path of the righteous is like the morning sun shining ever brighter till the full light of day. But the way of the wicked is like deep darkness. They do not know what makes them stumble. Help us walk faithfully on that righteous path, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Folks, any questions? Words of wisdom? Thank you so much. Yes. Right. Yeah. And that's like training can be get wisdom. Yeah, yeah. Without getting what are wisdom. Yeah, I quite like that because he's like it's almost like people would be like, Oh, I wish I could be wise and he's just saying, Well, be wise then. Exactly. Get, it. get it. It's there. Yeah. Like it's not gonna come to you. Go and get it. Exactly. Life can bring so many offers and better lives or it does. Or yeah. And what's helpful when those offers come, because I think a lot of that's empty promises, like if I have this relationship or if I have this, then a nice house or if I have X amount of kids, my life will be complete and I'll be the happiest person in the world. And many people who have that aren't because they put all their hope in that. And it's a directionless path. Because once you've got there, where do you go? There's no... Yeah. Yeah, you get to the top of the mountain, the only way is down. But the path that, that, that Christ wants us to go on is a path to eternal life and glory. And when he's the number one, you can enjoy those other things rightly because you've not made them God. You're walking towards who God is and there you're, therefore you're able to enjoy what God gives. And the example he gives in chapter five, the young man's obviously married, is enjoying his wife. Like, and enjoy that, that. That's such a great gift. The way he does that is by being wise and fixating on God and then he's able to enjoy his wife. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, Tom. That's, thank you, Tommy. I wish everybody. I wish everybody had the mental strength to cope with life. No. Yeah, it's hard. Yeah. yeah. It's hard, but if you're focused on what's important, you know, put off by what's not important. Yeah, and here's the encouraging thing: the God who made you is not silent, no. and He has given wisdom and He has spoken to us to guide us and to help us. He won't always. He very rarely gives answers to the frustrations we might face in our life, but he does tell us who he is. Like last week says, he calls us to trust him and his wisdom is there to guide us, to make sure that we can navigate through these difficulties. And that's what's encouraging about the Bible, that God cares so much that he's, he's not left me floundering about trying to figure it all out. Just because he's not stopped your arm from dying doesn't mean he's, there. he's not there. Exactly, yeah, exactly. Exactly, yeah. Yeah, that's exactly right. Good. Any other thoughts, questions? Somebody about to say something? No. Um, I'm going to sing, Come Now Fount. Every blessing. Um, there's a line in this hymn. There's a number of lines. Some of them are confusing. There's a bit where it talks about, here I raise my Ebenezer. It's not Ebenezer Scrooge. It's nothing to do with Christmas Carol. Ebenezer was a, it's a Hebrew word, 
And it's a reference to a story in the Old Testament where they uh, won a victory with God's help and they raised this stone, this monument called an Ebenezer, which means God is my help. And so in the hymn, when it's saying, here I raise my Ebenezer, it's a it's way of saying, I'm nailing my colors to the mast. God's the one who helps me. Um, but there's a great line where it says, tune my heart to sing thy grace. And that's what we want to do. Uh, even though our hearts are prone to wonder, um, God will always take us back. And let's ask as we sing this, that God would tune our hearts to sing thy grace. So let's stand together, and sing Come Thy Fountain, and remain standing for the closing prayer. just as we close and now may the God of peace who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus that great shepherd of the sheep equip you with everything good for doing his will and may he work in us what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ to whom be glory forever and ever Amen, Amen. Amen. Please do have a seat if you want some tea or coffee you will be served